Hi, I'm Deborah Holchip, editor of Michigan Today. In this episode of Listen in Michigan, my guest is Michelle Krell Kidd, a writer who also is a professionally trained nose in flavors and fragrance. Think of her unusual ability for smelling as the olfactory version of a photographic memory. Now, she's worked as a marketing consultant with perfumers and beauty companies, but Michelle's true passion lies in teaching others, especially teachers, how important a sense of smell can be in the learning experience. Research shows learning happens most effectively when our senses, preferably all five, are actively engaged. Seems we remember things more vividly when we experience them, as opposed to being told about them. Unfortunately, smell as a teaching tool rarely comes into play, at least on purpose, in the lecture hall, the computer lab, the library. In 2012, Michelle created Smell and Tell, a series of interactive programs she presents at the Ann Arbor District Library, 826 Michigan, and to private clients. As the name indicates, there's lots of smelling and telling to be done as she works with people and their noses to expand their understanding of the world and each other through smell. In June, Michelle presented Right Smells to Michigan educators who teach grades 6 through 12. These teachers were in the Middle East and North Africa and Southeast Asia teacher program, so they explored smells related to plants used in incense and perfumery from the Middle East, Southeast Asia, India, North Africa. Prior to the course, each teacher received a scent flight of eight aromatic essences, like frankincense and stuff. And then via Zoom, Michelle demonstrated how to transform the abstract nature of smell into articulated lived experience. Now that COVID has destroyed what we used to know as regular life, we are more aware of smell than ever. It is the sense the virus can take from us. And even though we know this, smell is still the bastard stepchild of the senses. And Michelle is on a mission to change that. I'll let her explain. Here's Michelle. We breathe from the moment we come out of the womb, right? So when we go to sleep at night, we dream. So we see in our head, uh, we don't really hear anything unless there's a loud noise that wakes us up out of bed, but we're always breathing. And I mean, and there's something to the fact that with that, you know, you can do this, close your eyes and you don't see. If I stop my nose in a certain amount of time, I'll be dead because I can't breathe. And, and COVID is a respiratory disease that takes your breath away. At the point we are in the pandemic now, um, I, I do not want to ever hear that long haul syndrome is not something to be concerned about because hospitalization and death are big things and we need to stop that now. But if you're talking about protracted smell loss, some people not getting it back, and also the, the discussion in the scientific community right now, which is this is memory sense. And there is concern based on studies that you know I've done a surface dive on. But the concern is early onset Alzheimer's or other diseases that relate to plaque buildup in the brain, et cetera, because you know, neurons get damaged and we don't understand the scope of what's really happening now. And uh, I really do not wish for anyone to have an experience where they're like, I wish I knew before how valuable the sense was because if you're breathing, it's valuable. There is a way to help yourself get better. They're not sure why it works or how well it works, but it's the best we have and it's non, non-medical. And it's pretty much what I teach people at Smell and Tell is you do olfactory calisthenics, but you do them with specific materials that you can vary. Um, this has been going on since Dr. Thomas Hummel, who is the renowned expert on smell loss, uh, has been trying to help people recovering from anosmia from um, upper respiratory infections. Uh, you know, the kinds where, you know, there's a possibility of getting better. And so, you know, his stuff is codified now. Um, and, and then there's critics that are like, well, you know, it's not totally proven. It's not totally proven, but it does help. His method makes sense. The philosophy is that if you stimulate smell and you stimulate the brain while doing that, even if you can't smell, while if things are in a state of repair, you can help yourself get better. And I think anyone who loses their sense of smell, I certainly would feel this way if it was me, I would want control. Um, I'd want control over the process. I'd wanna know that there was hope. 
I would want to know that there were people like me and that I wasn't going out of my mind. Because just think, right? We are experiencing, what is it, the, the five stages of grief? We have like the 500 stages of grief right now. Hey, as a person who suffers with chronic allergies and a stuffed up nose more often than not, I definitely value my sense of smell when I have it. But this conversation opened my eyes to some really interesting applications of Michelle's smell and tell concept. My dad, who passed away in 2018, had been a pipe smoker most of his life. He also loved cigars and chili and Old Spice cologne, all very distinctive scents. As he began to suffer dementia, I actually bought him some Old Spice to see if it would spark him up. It sparked me, that's for sure, as I flash back to childhood, watching him slap his cheeks with the fragrant cologne. Now listen in as Michelle describes an unforgettable experience she had with a friend's mother. Her mother was in a really, really nice assisted living facility here in Ann Arbor. And uh, she had stopped eating. Um, so she was on her way to the next, you know, mm -hmm. to the next journey. And she said, listen, uh, you know, she has Alzheimer's, but could you make a smell kit for her? And I said yes without thinking about it. But I did ask her some questions about memories she had with her mother, where her mother grew up, what was important to her, smells, flowers, fruit. And it so happened I was working on something for AADL and I had gotten all these gorgeous natural materials from a company called Roberte, which they're famous in the fragrance industry for the, like the best naturals on the planet. And um, I put something together, a uh, longer story I won't tell, but the, the, the end of it was, even though she couldn't speak, her mother could not speak, she started to flip her foot up at a couple of the ones that were really poignant, according to her daughter. Um, and so later after we were done, which was, this was moving, very moving experience. I gave her, I made a kit for her to have. And, and she called me at around nine and told me that her mother died that evening and she couldn't have had a better experience. And like, I got choked up and I was thinking, oh my God, this is what like clergy feel like when they're called to go in a room and maybe it's someone they've never met before. And I know this is going to sound weird. It is as the feeling has so much sanctity around it that even the sadness of it is is not absent, but the sanctity overrides the sadness. Even when I think about it, and I am, I'm a little for clown, to meet someone the, for the first time on the day that they leave is just profound. But to your point, as you were talking about, wouldn't it have been nice to smell things with your father? You know, this woman has a smell kit now where she can remember things with her mother. So why don't we do this with our elders? Do this for ourselves, because it's like pictures in the mind. I mean, you actually store smell memories, like your, your um, sensory impressions in the place that holds pictures and images. So you do have pictures of smell in your brain, just not the way we think of photographs, you know. Uh, there, and there's a lot that people don't know. And then they find out they're like, what? And I'm like, yeah, like when you smell something, close your eyes because your vision is an impediment to evaluating something, uh, not subjectively, but just evaluating it. And they start to see and feel and, and they, they're freaking out. Like they can't believe that this is happening. And this is the magic, right? Um, and you could do that with a cup of coffee. You could, uh, I don't know. I have favorite places to go to downtown because I just like to smell things. Okay, here's your challenge. Think back to your time in Ann Arbor. You're on the street. Did you have favorite smells in town? Restaurants you always walked by? What about scorekeepers or skeeps as the students call it with its dank cloud of vomit smell hanging low in the air around the Maynard Street parking garage? Hey, Kill One's never disappoints with its hot sugar smell. And how about that sizzling grease coming off the Fleetwood? Sometimes you actually have to walk inside a building to smell it. Like one of Michelle's favorite spots the West Side Bookshop on Liberty. So first of all, you go in and it's, you know, it's all the books, but in the back, cause it's in this like old kind of Victorian brownstone building, uh, there's a, a room of books, but it has maps and usually some vintage typewriter that they're selling. So it has a slightly different smell, but it also, it feels like you're on a set of the Twilight Zone and you just stepped into reality from 1942. You know, um, it just, it's, it's stunning. And then you could kind of even go back more. Like if you look at the art books, you can start to feel Victorian. Um, these places are precious, but it's often, it's not just what's in them. It's what you sense that actually makes you come back and also makes you enjoy being there. Let's see what I could do. Take it easy. You too. 
So our next stop on this sensory tour is the ice cream shop, just down the street from Westside Bookshop. It's called the Creamery. When they make waffles in, in, inside and the door is closed, right? This is why you would want to do this now. But um, if you walk in and you're there for at least two minutes while they're in the waffle iron, you will walk out and your hair and your shirt will smell like waffles. I mean, it's free perfume. Anyone can do this because it's really cool. And sometimes it happens by accident. So let's say you went shopping and you have a paper bag and it starts to rain and you forgot your umbrella. And your paper bag gets wet, right? You know what happens? <laughs> There's a molecule called vanillin that's part of the paper processing uh, uh, process. Okay. And vanillin is used to make vanilla flavor for ice cream. It can be derived from trees or it can be synthetically created using chemistry. And the rain on the wet paper bag activates the vanillin. That's kind of a nostalgic smell too. That goes back, you know, for generations of people who went to the University of Michigan from before there were plastic bags, which was like, I guess, before 75 or something like that. Um, then that smell might be attached to some kind of nostalgia. There's all these little things that we don't often think of, but if it was a torrential downpour, like in the spring, and you were caught with a bag, you would remember it. Okay, at this point, I had to tell her one of my favorite smells, the library, specifically my childhood library in Birmingham. As I described the smell to her, the only word that seemed to do it justice was fluorescent. But is that a smell? It sounded so weird. Not to Michelle, though. This is the element we don't see, right? Because this is my area of specialty is, is decoding the invisible, right? So I'm always thinking about what no one's noticing because I'm just kind of wired that way. There are some smells that can be a little fusty and musty. And when you say fluorescent, to me, I hear that word. And, and the meaning to me is like, it's the artificial light, right? Mm -hmm. So then, then that can go into areas that are just not as enjoyable, but yet it's not horrible because you're associating it with the library. It's, 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 it's the context, right? Yeah. Because a fluorescent light in a surgery is not the same as a fluorescent light in a library. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And remember it's surrounded by glass, there's metal, there's plastic. So there is a scentscape up inside the, uh, the light fixture that sort of comes out based on what kind of ventilation is there, how into the density of books. Um, I also have made friends with someone who I just love to death, who's in charge of uh, restoring books and papyrus and has a very specialized job at the university. I've smelled uh, scrolls. She invited me to the Burr building where they actually do book restoration. And the whole floor smells like the, the good old book smell. And I don't want to leave. Um, and that also, it makes your hair and your shirt smell. So like, can you imagine going to work and coming back smelling like a great old book? Like to me, that's great. To them, they're just like, ah, I'm so done with this already. I was allowed to go to the basement of um, the Kelsey Museum. After I got someone at Smell and Tell to tell someone who I said, I want to smell mummies that I wasn't a nut job. Um, and so <laughs> that was an interesting experience. Um, I'll take a pass on the mummy sniffing. What sounds more appealing is Michelle's other favorite hotspot, a section of Washington Street during the dinner hour. I, I eat mostly not meat, but I do eat meat sometimes. But I say it's dangerous for vegetarians because you will start salivating the minute you hit that street at five o'clock <laughs> because they're, they're prepping stuff in the kitchen. There's grilling going on. And you literally, there's there's several episodes of, again, I'm dating myself, but what the heck, Bugs Bunny, right? When he smells a carrot, but he can't see it and he starts floating and there's this little cloud of carrot smell, right? You start doing that thinking like, where's the hamburger? You know, or I, I really need a steak now. But anytime between five and seven, I could be blindfolded and I can tell you where I was. I mean, there's... <laughs> There's always a meat surprise. I'm sorry, vegetarians. You know, when certain scents are situated in the environment, we call it a scentscape. That's the academic term for it, but it's, uh, or, or a smellscape. I love how it smells in here. Can we, get, can we sell it as a plug-in? <laughs> we should try. The most traumatic thing that ever happened to me, and, and it, it was related to a smell, was my father-in-law shot a snake. And, and you smelled the hot shot in the snake after it got killed. And that was... I was like, I don't ever, like, I'm glad the snake is dead, but I just don't want to smell that again. So, you know, since our sense of smell is designed to detect pleasure and danger, usually the smells that we don't like 
can sometimes trip up that danger thing. And of course, the smell of burning flesh from shot in a snake, that's death before decomposition. So of course, I'm not going to like that, right? Um, but there are certain things, like there are foods that smell horrible, that taste great. Certain French cheeses that smell like, you know, overripe sneakers in a gym locker that hasn't been opened for 100 years. And that is really your brain saying, danger, danger, you know, and you have to kind of talk your way through it if you decide, you know, you're going to have a piece of the stinky cheese. For years, Michelle has sought to use scent as a way to overcome our differences and find what connects us. Her virtual Right Smells program confirmed what she already knew. Once people start smelling things together, the world opens up. You know, I've been wanting to teach teachers. I mean, since I was trained in the fragrance industry, so that's going back to like 2001, no, 2002, excuse me. Wow, God, I'm ancient. Um, and I loved the, the uh, community that sharing uh, sensory impressions and emotions and memories build. Do I know more about this person now? Because you learn about each other. This is the community building aspect. Uh, the thing you have to teach people when they're going to use sense and they're going to be evaluative is that there are no wrong answers. And that really upends the whole academic life approach that you have to be right, you have to get it. And it's because it's not about that. Um, and, and it's not about not having emotion about something, but it's just about seeing what something is. And since smells uh, can be related to food, right, then we get cultural relationships. So that uh, we had a few history teachers that were at that smell and tell that immediately got, oh my God, I could teach about the spice trade. I don't have to buy, you know, fancy essential oils. I can just get spices. Um, and so they kind of woke up that way. And again, this is something, it's literally right in front of our noses, but we don't see it. It's fascinating to see group behavior and how they evolve towards talking about something they can't see that they're sensing. But what's more fascinating is when they discuss their memories and the community building aspect happens when people have common or know someone who had an experience like someone's discussing, like something will come up and someone will say, uh, for instance, with Rose, right? They think about grandmothers, yeah. not because it smells like an old lady, it's fresh, but they just associate. So, so all of a sudden these boundaries, right, which can be gender, can be race, can be, you know, culture, you know, of sexual, all these things, you know, these, you know, things that we look for, we stop looking for them. And we just start being present for what's there and, and the common humanity. And yeah. so that being said, what it could do in classrooms is it creates confidence in dealing with unknowns and things you can't see. But for learning, I'm going to remember more as a kindergartner or a, you know, a sophomore in college if there is cinnamon in front of me when someone is talking about the spice trade, because I'm actually going to be putting that layer, that that picture of a smell in my mind of an experience versus being taught something, right? So it's experiential learning is not skimming the surface of a thing, but looking into it. This is what scientists do. Hello. If you're an anthropologist or an archaeologist, you're digging and you're looking what, what's there, what's there. And we've lost that because we've become a culture of gazers because of our cell phones and the internet. I, and I, I don't say that like I'm an, I'm not anti-internet. It's just that we're doing this way more than we're doing it not that way. And so getting students when they're young interested in smell, it's just like music. It opens them up to non-visual experiences that are just as valuable, if not more sometimes. I just, I think smell brings concepts to life, particular concepts. So uh, anyone who has an area of specialty and they're, you know, they're, they're deep in pedagogy, they need to look for those things. And actually they probably could find them right where they live or in their classroom. One, it's again, when you look into something instead of skimming the surface, you just realize how magnificent the world is and like who doesn't want to have some of that now when we feel like everything's falling apart sometimes i'll open a bottle of flex conditioner in the grocery aisle just to inhale myself back to a happier moment in time next time you smell something that really captivates you close your eyes and let your mind go there at the very least stop and smell the roses would you 
Grandma needs a shout out. Thanks for listening, you guys. See you next time. And as always, go blue.